Greetings and welcome to St. John's Church. We are delighted to have you joining us today for worship. And as we continue during uh, these odd times of social distancing and quarantine, we are excited uh, to be able to come to you this way. And we hope uh, that this service uh, will be a blessing to you and a source of strength uh, and encouragement. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Let us pray. O God, whose Son, Jesus Christ, is the good shepherd of your people, grant that when we hear his voice, we may know him who calls us each by name and follow where he leads, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Our first lesson is the 23rd Psalm, and uh, I will read it from the King James Version. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. I ask that you would uh, please pray with me. Lord, we come to you now boldly with the confidence that David has when he wrote Psalm 23, to your honor and to your glory, Lord. Would you give us ears to hear your voice, our good shepherd. And we pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, today we're going to take a look at Psalm 23, which is arguably the most uh, famous psalm, uh, which is recorded in Scripture, one that's been cherished by Christians for generations and generations. When the Christian catacombs that were used in the first four centuries were rediscovered under Rome, Uh, towards the end of the 19th century, it was the image of the shepherd that was most often found on the walls of those catacombs, along with the fish and the vine. But it was the shepherd that characterized the art of the very first Christians. And that image of a shepherd who cares for his flock has remained with us even today. We cherish the words of Psalm 23, which in large part is the foundation throughout Scripture, even for us today, which Jesus used and elaborated on uh, in the Gospels, and especially in John chapter 10. And we cherish this image so much and this psalm so much that we even, like we just did, would read it in the familiar language in which most of us have learned it, the language of the King James Version, even though that is language which is no longer familiar to us in a day-to-day sort of situation, and yet we long for the familiarity of those words, for the comfort that they bring us. And so we read them in the words in which we learn them. Now at the dire risk of boring you with the familiar, I want to take a look at Psalm 23. And I want to look at it according to the, stru- to the structure that David the psalmist used to direct our attention to his main point. You know, part of the compelling charm of this psalm is just how it can communicate strikingly simple affirmations of the confidence that we can have in God. There are three affirmations which are made in this psalm, in verses 1, 4, and 6. They are simple, and they are sweet, and they are profound. David writes, I shall not want, I will fear no evil, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. If this is all that we get from this psalm, well, then our lives truly have been richly blessed because they proclaim to us truth about who God is and about the love and care and concern that he has for us. These three declarations affirm what the rest of of Scripture declares, that we live under the providence of a God who protects us and who cares for us, both now and into eternity. But this psalm is noteworthy 
not just because of these simple and clear affirmations, but because of the way that it introduces several themes that mirror each other and that build on each other and so that we find one clear point at the end, one clear focus, one thing that shows us the reason why our hope, our Christian hope, is stronger and more durable than anything else this world can offer. And so if you're able, I ask that you would read along with me at Psalm 23 as we take a look at these themes which David has woven together for us. The first theme is found in verse 1, and it's mirrored in verse 6, the last verse of the psalm. And this theme is that God alone is our provider. Verse 1 reads, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Verse 6 reads, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now sometimes, and especially with poetry, we have to rely on context to derive meaning from the words that are written. And one commentator on this psalm who spent his career, uh, the majority of his career at least, living in the Judean countryside um, in which this scene is set, he offers us this helpful note. He says, Before modern times and cell phones, the moment the lone traveler and the shepherd left the shelter and protection of the village, they were on their own. They were on their own. In this opening verse, we see a commitment to the Lord as the singular source of security when no other help is available. Out in the open, it is the shepherd alone who is capable of providing for his sheep. Their hope has no other option but to rest in him. And we see that God is the good shepherd, and that he cares for us even more than we can fathom, that he provides security for us not only in this life, but in the life that is to come. And that is what verse 6 adds to this theme for us. And so we see David's first point in introducing this idea, that with God as our shepherd, our needs are met. And even more than that, we experience a blessing in this life that will continue, that will continue into the next. The second theme that David introduces to us in this psalm is found in verse 2, and it's mirrored in verse 5. And that is the theme of food and drink, and of God's provision for our sustenance. Verse 2 describes the idyllic place of rest for a sheep. It's the best of all worlds, if you are a sheep. It's where food is in abundance. There is green grass as far as the eye can see. The water, it's calm, it is assured, and it is abundant. Here in this place, the sheep's need for sustenance are perfectly met, perfectly provided for, so that the sheep may eat and drink and rest in peace, with no fear of want, with no fear of attack. Verse 5 shifts the image for us. It shifts from this idyllic pasture to the table. Verse 5 reads that you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. We see in verse 5 that God prepares a place for us at his table where he is the host. And it's in the presence of our enemies that we can sit and eat because of the security that he provides us. We are welcomed there, as is seen by the fact that we are anointed guests, anointed with oil. And we are well cared for as our cup overflows at the table of our host. Taken together, David declares in these verses that not only are our needs for food and drink met in God, but that God is in fact our host. It is his table at which we come to eat and drink. And it is at his table that we are generously cared for, that we find protection, that we are welcomed, and that we are generously provisioned. The third theme 
that David introduces in this psalm is found in the connection of verses 3 and verse 3 with the end of verse 4. Verse 3 reads, He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Then the end of verse 4 reads that, For you are with me. Notice the shift. No longer is God spoken of in the third person, but in the second person. For you, God, you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now to say that God restores my soul is to admit two things. It's to admit, first, that we are, in fact, in need of restoration. And it's to admit that that restoration must come from somewhere else other than ourselves. It is God who provides for us. It is God who restores our souls. But why would he do it? He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. You see, our restoration is for his name's sake. It is because he is good, that he acts for our good, that he restores us. And then as we see in the second half of verse 4, not only does he restore us, but that he remains with us, that he provides for us, that he protects us, and that he provides support through his rod and through his staff. Not only does God act out of his goodness in coming after us to restore us and to lead us, but he reveals his goodness to us by the comfort of his constant presence in our lives, no matter the circumstances. And so now we come to the the tip of the arrow, the point, the primary point which David makes in this psalm, which we see in the first half of verse 4. David's main point, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. How is this possible? Well, it's because God, as our shepherd, meets our every need in this life and the next. It's because we are invited to his table, where we are protected, where we are welcomed, where we are well cared for and nourished abundantly. It's because out of his goodness, he seeks after us to restore us and then to remain with us, to maintain that restoration in us. It's because of these things that we can say we have no fear. It's because of these things that even in the valley of the shadow of death, we are assured of our confidence in our Lord and our God and in our shepherd. Now today, we have an advantage over David. And that we can look back and see the name and the person who is the provider of these things for us. We have seen the good shepherd. We know his name. In John chapter 10, verse 11, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. This is the advantage that we have over David. We stand on this side of the cross and we can look back with assurance to see how in Jesus all of our needs in this life and the next are met because of his work on our behalf and for his glory on the cross. It's through Jesus that we are invited to the table of the Lord. It's through Jesus that we find our protection, that we are nourished. It's because of Jesus that we take comfort in God's goodness in restoring us and in remaining with us. And it's because of the person, Jesus Christ, who provides these things for us that we take confidence and that we can have no fear, no matter the circumstances, even in the valley of the shadow of death. Friends, this is what sets the hope of the Christian apart. Our hope is not just a wish. It's not just a a meager desire for a positive outcome. It is a confident expectation of what is to come that is based in the knowledge of what has already taken place. Based in the knowledge of Jesus Christ on the cross. It's founded on the one who has achieved it all and promises to provide on our behalf for our good and for his glory. Take confidence in the Lord, our good shepherd. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeded from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one holy Catholic and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. <clears throat> Almighty and ever-living God, we are taught by your holy word to offer prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all people. We humbly ask you mercifully to receive our prayers, inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord, and grant that all who confess your holy name may agree in the truth of your holy word and live in unity and godly love. Lord, in your mercy. Hear Lord, our prayer. We pray that you will lead the nations of the world in the way of righteousness and so guide and direct their leaders, especially President Trump, Governor McMaster, and Mayor Wakila, that your people may enjoy the blessings of freedom and peace. Grant that our leaders may impartially administer justice, uphold integrity and truth, restrain wickedness and vice, and protect true religion and virtue. And we commend to thy gracious care and keeping all those who serve the common good, especially our military, those in law enforcement, first responders, and all those who go into harm's way to protect us, to defend us, and to rescue us from danger. We pray especially for Joel Billings, Hartwell Bryant, T.J. Carpenter, Jonathan Carroll, Alan Cott, Matt Harvey, Bridge Jernigan, David Lamb, Andrew McCaria, Peter McCann, Paul Miller, Mike Shaw, John Taff, Stephen Turner, Ricky Tyner, and Peter Warren. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. <clears throat> give grace, Heavenly Father, to all bishops, priests, and deacons, and especially to your servants, Archbishop Foley Beach, and Bishop Mark Lawrence, that by their life and teaching they may proclaim your true and life-giving word and rightly and duly administer your holy sacraments. And to all your people, give your heavenly grace, especially to this congregation, that with reverent and obedient hearts we may hear and receive your holy word and serve you in holiness and righteousness all the days of our lives. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Prosper, we pray, all those who proclaim the gospel of your kingdom throughout the world, and strengthen us to fulfill your great commission, making disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to obey all that you have commanded. 
Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We ask you in your goodness, O Lord, to comfort and sustain all who are in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, especially Peter Bike, Bailey Cannon, Katie Creighton, Joanne Fisher, Lee Gary, Marty Green, Mary Hepburn, Bruce King, Tripp Lizenby, Jim McMillan, Billy McCrary, Diane Mayer, Shirley Munn, James Schofield, Asa Skinner, Coot Smith, Robin Stith, Frank Stork, Paul Wallace, Agnes Wilcox, and Bob Youngblood. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We remember before you all your servants who have departed this life in your faith and fear, especially Mary Jackson, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we ask you to give us grace to follow the good examples of St. John and all your saints, that we may share with them in your heavenly kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we also thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life, especially for the birth of Amy Edmonds Buchanan, daughter of Amy and Will Buchanan, and granddaughter of Amy and Malloy McCann. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Almighty God, Father, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men, we acknowledge and bewail our manifold sins and wickedness, which we from time to time most grievously have committed by thought, word, and deed, against thy divine majesty, provoking most justly thy wrath and indignation against us. We do earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for these our misdoings. The remembrance of them is grievous unto us. The burden of them is intolerable. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. For thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, Forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please thee in newness of life, to the honor and glory of thy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come unto me, all who travail and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, to the end that all that believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is a true saying, and worthy of all men to be received, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. If any man sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The peace of the Lord be always with you, and, and also, also with you. you. God's, God's, peace. Peace. God's peace. God's peace. Uh, God's peace again and welcome. Uh, as I said at the beginning of the service, we are delighted to have you with us uh, uh, for this online service. Uh, these are indeed uh, crazy times and uh, we are excited to be with you any way we can, but we all uh, long for the day when we can be back together again uh, physically here in this place and uh, we are hopeful uh, that that will be coming soon. Just a couple of quick announcements today. Number one, uh, we are working hard uh, as a staff to get our online giving up and running, and that should be available soon. Hopefully next Sunday uh, we will have 
uh, the announcements ready to go, and that will be all up and running, so it will be easy to give online uh, from your home. I do want to encourage uh, all of you to continue with your giving here at St. John's. Um, our bills remain constant even during this time. Payroll, uh, all of our utilities, and lots of our other ministries. There are a few things where we're saving some money during this time, but by and large, most of our expenses, like yours at home, remain the same. So I do want to encourage you to continue uh, to keep current with your pledge and with your giving during this time. Uh, the second thing that I'd like to do is uh, wish all of our folks who are celebrating birthdays this week a happy birthday. Happy birthday to Hannah Hopewell, Jenny Rains, Betty Fowler, John Greenan, John Jordan, Shay Carl, Rainey Rabin, and Mary Barlow. We also have several folks that are celebrating anniversaries this week, and we'd like to wish them a happy anniversary as well. Happy anniversary to Gray and Thomas Hunter, to Peggy and Bob Youngblood, to Nikki and Billy Nasso, to Lori and Pete Warren, and to Annie and Jay Ham. Again, we are so excited to have you here with us, but like you, we long for the time when we can gather back together uh, in community with one another and in communion with our Heavenly Father. But thank you again so much for worshiping with us today. And now we will conclude our service uh, with our closing prayers. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretch out your arms of love on the hard wood of the cross that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you. For the honor of your name. Amen. Amen. And now together we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I ask that you join me in the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service, and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord, to make our common supplications to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Amen. And now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Alleluia, alleluia.